Hello, everyone. Welcome to Life Science Across the Globe. I'm Janine Stevens, one of the Janelia organizers of this series. And on behalf of all eight sister institutes, I want to welcome you to today's event on air quality and infectious disease, hosted by the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. I want to remind everyone to please visit lifesciencecrosstheglobe.org to see our full lineup of monthly events to subscribe to the events calendar and to view recordings of past events. Uh, we would also love your input on a very brief survey that we'll post in the chat box at the end of today's session. So as a reminder to trainees, you are invited to stay on the call after the event today for a special meet the panelists session. Um, and for everybody during the event, please write your questions in the Q&A box at any time and our moderator will ask them during the Q&A period after the talks. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Joanne Passmore, Associate Professor at IDM Cape Town for some opening remarks. Joanne. Thanks, Janine. Um, so it gives, gives me great pleasure to open the seminar on air quality and infectious diseases on behalf of the Institute of Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. The vision of our Institute is to be an international center of excellence where world-class scientists work together to tackle diseases of major importance in Africa with a mission to um, conduct, develop African scientific capacity to influence health policy and practice by translating these scientific discoveries and applying them in the communities we work. Our major research groupings within the Institute focus on infectious diseases, particularly tuberculosis, COVID, as well as HIV. I'm thrilled that the Institute is able to host this particular seminar on air quality, as I can think of no better time to remind ourselves about this critical fact in the spread of infectious diseases. So with that, I'd pass over to Professor Donald Milton from the University of Maryland, who will moderate today's seminar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. And um, this is a very exciting um, session that we have here today. And um, um, I would like to share a few slides here um, as I talk uh, and give us a little introduction here. Our topic today, uh, air quality and infectious disease, is very broad and timely. COVID-19 pandemic focused renewed attention on the relationship of air quality and infection. This title could be interpreted in two ways, both of which are important topics we could easily spend the entire day on. Um, and first, the impact of indoor air quality on the potential for receiving an infectious dose via aerosol inhalation. And the second might be the impact of ambient air pollution on the likelihood of infection and disease in exposed populations. Unfortunately, we cannot cover both today. So today's seminar will concern the first of these two topics, indoor air quality and infectious diseases. And within that topic, we won't be discussing the importance of indoor air pollution, which as from biomass, coal burning, uh, cook stoves, uh, is an important contributor to the global burden of respiratory diseases in its own right. Uh, while indoor air pollution may also impact susceptibility to infection and severe disease, that's not our focus today. Today's seminar concerns the role of aerosols as vehicles of transmission for respiratory infection from person to person. This is the aerobiological pathway for airborne infection. Chad Roy described it as the elusive pathway in a perspective that we wrote in the New England Journal following the 2003 SARS epidemic. Today, most of the talks will focus on the left-hand and middle panels of this figure and within them mainly on the human respiratory tract as a source uh, and physical aspects of the transport and dispersion component of the pathway. Although not a focus of today's talks, it's also important to recognize the site of deposition in the respiratory tract plays a critical role. Tuberculosis, the topic of one talk, can only be transmitted via aerosols that can deposit in the pulmonary region deep in the lung. Other pathogens can be transmitted by agents deposited in the nasopharyngeal and or tracheal bronchial airways, 
But where they deposit may still play an important role in determining the severity of disease for certain agents that are anisotropic, including influenza and smallpox. As scientists, you're probably aware that an aerosol is defined as a suspension of particles dispersed in a gas. But even the definition of this term has been a matter of contention and public understanding of what we mean continues to lag due to an abject failure of science communication growing out of vast miseducation of the majority of the medical community extending back over 100 years. Understanding the modes and mechanisms of airborne transmission, that is transmission occurring due to inhalation and deposition of aerosol particles in the respiratory tract, is important not only for understanding the utility of masks and respirators, of ventilation and filtration, and of air disinfection as non-pharmaceutical interventions to limiting transmission. It's also critically important for the design of effective pharmaceutical countermeasures intended to block transmission. For example, intranasal interferon and zanamivir are protected against experimental influenza infection via intranasal installation but did not protect against naturally acquired infection. However, intranasal interferon was effective against rhinovirus and orally inhaled zanamivir was effective against influenza in household studies. Today, there's great interest in universal influenza, pan coronavirus and mucosal vaccines capable of preventing not only severe disease, but hopefully also to prevent infection and transmission. But exactly what part of the respiratory mucosa must we protect against which pathogens? In recognition of the importance of this question, plan for universal influenza vaccine issued in 2018, the United States National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Diseases identified as objective 1.1, expand understanding of influenza transmission and identify targets for improved disease control measures. So today we will be looking again at the source term and the transport and dispersion primarily. And we will hear from three outstanding scientists. The first speaker today will be Lydia Marwaska, Distinguished Professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences, University of Queensland, Australia. Professor Marwaska will start us off by talking about the source side of the aerobiological pathway in a talk entitled how particles are generated during our respiratory activities. Thank you. Um, very good afternoon from sunny Krakow, where I arrived uh, about an hour ago from London, worrying that my, that my flight would arrive on time, by, but it did. Well, um, I, uh, uh, in a way, continue from what uh, Don started, the issue of definitions. Is it aerosol or droplet? Uh, well, I'm coming from aerosol science, um, so aerosol is an um, assembly of liquid and solid particle suspended in a gaseous medium long enough to enable observation and measurement, and droplet is a liquid particle, nothing to do with size. But as we know, in medicine, it's different. Aerosol are small particles, droplet larger particles, that's um, how Don explained, and the divisions between them. Well, we won't worry about this. And my approach, since I've realized this, uh, these problems and the difficulties in kind of, um, uh, well, deciding uh, who would want to give up which definitions, I'd say let's call them particles. And this way it's properly from both areas of the disciplines and we, and well, we don't worry about this. So I will call, call it a particle or particles. And we are a source of respiratory particles. We all have respiratory fluids, as we know. Particles are formed from the fluids during all our respiratory activities. And they are emitted through the mouth or nose. Sometimes we can see them like with this salivating dog, but we can also occasionally see them when talking to an overexcited colleague. So how are they aerosolized? How are they formed? If we start from the process of aerosolization, the definition is such. It results from the passage of an airstream of a sufficiently high speed over the surface of a liquid. 
Now, where is this airstream and where is the liquid? It is um, in different parts of our respiratory tract. From a very simplistic point of view, we can compare aerosolization to uh, what happens in this old fashioned perfume bottle or a nebulizer, which um, many of us use for many different purposes. Now, the one part of the complexity is that uh, our respiratory tract contains not one, but many nebulizers, and not only. The, the, the uh, aerosolization is not the only process in which particles are generated in the respiratory tract. There are several, several different other processes. In particular, if we look what happened in the, uh, in the deepest part of the respiratory tract, in the bronchioli, now it's not aerosolization, but it is the burst of particles during uh, inhalation and production of the particles. So that's that um, a, a narrowing passage and then bursting uh, when it opens. Slightly different process takes care in larynx. This is, uh, this is aerosolization during uh, voicing, um, uh, during well, vocal cord vibration. And then in the mouth, um, there are several processes, but here we've got saliva and uh, aerosolization and other processes between the tongue, teeth, um, and lip during speech articulation. So as you can see, there's quite a complexity into, uh, into this, and this is not the, the end of the complexity. So the particles are formed, and before they are emitted, they already undergo uh, various processes. And in particular, um, some of them uh, deposit uh, already before they are emitted, which means this changes the initial size distribution. And then there was this fascinating paper published in Science two years ago about this viscous bubbles uh, and uh, what happens. And these things, uh, it was pointed out by the authors, can happen in the respiratory tract, leading to, spe to a special type of particles. So it is complex. Just showing this um, um, in a cross section, this process in the bronchioli region. If we start from the top and air flows uh, towards the right, so the uh, bronchioli is fully open. And then as air continues flowing, it contracts and eventually it's contracted completely and filled with liquid. And then air starts where we are breathing in and out, um, air flows in, in the opposite direction, and here the, um, the bubble sort of pops. So this is generation of the particles. Well, it's all good, but we cannot measure this process directly, but model and simulate. Uh, maybe sometime in the future, we will have some kind of nanobot, nanobots or whatever, which we could send down the respiratory tract, but this is not possible. And any uh, uh, attempt, well, there, there, there have been many attempts and items of doing this uh, based on um, some uh, experimental setups and so on. Well, it helps, but it is not exactly what's happening. So the level of understanding is good qualitative, but very limited quantitative what exactly, exactly happens there. So now detection of these particles, detection after they leave our nose and mouth. I'll say a few words about instrumental techniques. I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, many of my colleagues, particularly medical colleagues would say, well, uh, bring your particle counter and do measure this or this uh, or that. Um, well, it's normally not that simple that just bring a particle counter and measure some, something. If you want to measure something meaningful, it's much more complex. This is a setup of our initial um, experimental flow tunnel which we, in which we measured um, the size distribution and concentration of particles emitted during different respiratory uh, activities. So as you can see, the particles are flowing down with this uh, um, straightened flow. And then down the track, we, have, uh, we had several different type of instruments for measuring particles of different 
sizes, because as, as, I'll, as I'll explain in a minute, there is a great variation in sizes. That's how the tunnel looks from, from inside and from the side. But there are other instrumental techniques. Um, for example, this one, a study conducted by Zayas and colleagues. This is of course aerosol on an open bench. And here they use a different um, uh, instrumentation altogether, laser diffraction, uh, diffractionometry system, an open bench. What they measured was different and they, they gave a different kind of angle to our understanding. None of this, uh, whether the first set which I saw or the Zaya set, uh, wouldn't allow us to deal with the issues of low concentrations or if we want to keep the particles for any kind of analysis. So in our study, later study, we um, designed this uh, rotating drum and here the particles accumulated. And this was very useful because first of all, uh, we could achieve higher concentrations, which we couldn't in a flow tunnel, Flow tunnel gave us exact uh, age of the particles, but concentrations were low. Or we could test how long pathogens stay viable in infectious um, in, in a system like this. But it's not suitable for fast changing processes. So there are many, many different experimental approaches and it all depends what's the aim of our study. So size distribution of particles. This is uh, what came from some of the experiment, uh, experiments with that our original uh, flow tunnel. So it's a, a bit complex um, diagram, but um, hope uh, I'll be able to explain exactly what's happening here. So on the horizontal axis, logarithmic scale, we've got particle diameter and particle concentration also on logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. So first of all, we can see that the majority of the particles, the peak is in this smaller um, uh, size range, and they're, they're significantly higher majority because of the logarithmic scale. So the particles are basically 10 micrometers and, uh, and less. The importance of this is that these particles are light and small enough, they can stay suspended for quite a long time. You can also see this uh, different modes here. The first one is a bronchialite um, fluid field burst mode from the deepest part. And it's believed that this is where um, an H5N1 virus uh, is originates and resides. Slightly bigger mode is laryngeal vibration mode and the biggest one oral speed articulation, the biggest and the widest. And this is where uh, H, the source of H1N1. Now, something to point out that like the, this looks nice, sm small, um, smooth curve, but it's not something which comes just from one instrument. It required 10 data processing steps to get to that point. And I'm also pointing out to the scale, we are talking about particle number concentration. So the level of understanding of this is good quantitative and replicated in numerous studies, other studies than ours as well. Now, where's the virus in these particles? Because those particles were just any particles and the particles, the physics of particles don't really care whether there's virus uh, or not. Virus um, is this, this virus, SARS-CoV-2, naked virus is about 0.12 micrometer, which immediately tells us that the size of virus laden particles has to be larger than this because particles, when they are formed, aerosolized or formed in any other of these processes, they contain water, mucus, salts, and so on, so they are bigger. Uh, how much bigger? Well, it's been demonstrated that particles smaller than one micrometer in general contain higher loads of SARS-CoV-2. Not, not that one individual particles contain um, a, such a high load, but because the majority, the vast majority are in this size range, that's where the highest load is. So level of understanding, a reasonable majority we meet um, some, some micrometer to um, early micrometer uh, range. Now, this is um, also um, along these lines in terms of um, where the virus is obtained from very different type of studies, measurements in mass of mass size distribution 
in mixed um, rooms, hospital rooms. Uh, now, this was done by two types of instruments. So first of all, aeronomic particle size are similar to what we measured, which gave the researchers the um, size distribution, but also they used a um, Nair sample to collect for um, biological sampling. And since this is in the room, so there are all respiratory activities and the background. Now, I'd also like to point out that there were several data processing steps, so it's not just coming from the instrument. And also, please note the scale, because you may say, okay, what I saw before, the majority was in the, in the submicrometer range, and there was a little um, in the um, larger size, and here's the other way around. Now, this is mass distribution. The point is that the mass of um, a few larger particles significantly overshadow, uh, overshadows many, many more small particles, but this is just mass. But the most important point which I wanted to show here is that the highest load is, uh, was in, the, in this smaller um, size below one micrometer. So this was a study by um, uh, Santarpia and colleagues. So concentration of the particles in the air after we understand their um, size distribution. Concentration sometimes um, expresses concentrations sometimes as emission rates. Now again, this is from that early, that the first study which I mentioned. So we've got the activity and the activities including breathing, nose, mouth, counting, voice, whisper, and then concentration on the uh, vertical axis. So first of all, we can see that all respiratory activities contribute to particles, but breathing the least. Well, on the other hand, we breathe all the time. What contributed the highest concentration was singing. It wasn't quite singing. It was this ah, uh, that what we were able to reproduce in this study. Now, there were other similar studies uh, much later um, conducted, well, sometime later, 10 years later, studied by Asadi and colleagues, and they showed very similar results with different activities from nose to mouth breathing and then loud speaking. And again, as you can see, breathing the least and speaking loud speaking, the highest concentrations. So what we can say that there's a good quantitative um, understanding uh, of relative concentrations emissions. Now, there are differences due to different instrument systems used. Now, one can say, well, well, that's a problem if we have these differences, but we can explain this well, uh, very well if we wanted to bring them together to the same kind of um, um, scale, we could. But this is the, the reason that we, different instruments and systems are used. Um, there's insufficient data for different age groups and susceptibilities. Um, now, just uh, something which uh, was published uh, recently during um, uh, this pandemic, more on how loudness affects particle emissions. I thought that was a very interesting study. Uh, and um, going into depths of this loudness with, with uh, exactly measuring decibels of different uh, activities. So you can see how this um, setup, experimental setup was um, um, arranged with this panel here. And then the uh, air was going, I think it was oh, yeah, to, to the APS aerodynamic particle sizer. But in addition, this loudness major. Now, happy birthday. Um, so here we've got the different activities on the horizontal scale and then normally normalized particle mass concentration. What I wanted to show and compare is this one. The, the, the top here is the loudest happy birthday. And we compare this with breathing out of mouth. So well, the first glance say, okay, happy birthday is um, a, a more than breathing. But if you look at the scale, it's logarithmic scale, vertical scale. So we are talking almost 100 times more um, when we are singing than when we are just breathing. That's something to keep in mind. And there's also something interesting, a, a study to which I was invited on this topic um, of the impact of airway hygiene. What's airway hygiene? 
Now, hygiene, airway hygiene, is to make sure that uh, airways are hydrated. There's always a problem we, when airways are dry. So this hydration here, we're using two um, uh, drug prenasal um, saline formulation and then comprised with this salts. It was conducted in uh, three different locations across the United States and India in Bangalore. And well, these are the details how it was measured. The, um, co collect the, the measurement itself was relatively simple again with a funnel and going to, the, to a particle counter. Now, so what was the outcome of this? Um, that was the study, um, first study published on this topic. Um, I highlighted the uh, outcome, but I uh, emphasize it here um, and stress. So respiratory droplets, what was measured, diminished in number on exhalation by to up to 99% via the airway hygiene administration of nasal saline uh, rich in calcium. That was quite amazing. We just couldn't believe this, that the, the impact was so high. And I must say that first, without sort of thinking much about this, I, would, I, I thought, well, there will be more liquid, perhaps there will be more particles. Um, there's no uh, uh, clear explanation yet. Um, is this because of the changes to lung sur surface characteristics, flow pattern, something else? But it sure shows the significance of this aspect of uh, hydration of air of airways. Now I'm stressing the, the factor of just exhalation, but this was the initial objective of the study was to look on the impact of um, deposition of particles from um, um, polluted air. So with this. Um, uh, thank you. I won't summarize this again because I was trying. I tried to summarize every aspect of this, so I will be looking forward to answering your questions later. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Lydia. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, I think this uh, question about concentration of organisms in the uh, smaller particles is quite an interesting one. Maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. Our second speaker will be Professor Robin Wood director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center in South Africa. His talk is entitled, Out of Thin Air, Capturing and Visualization of TB Aerosols. His talk bridges the source and transport and dispersion components of the pathway. Good afternoon from uh, Cape Town. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, the uh, organizers, life sciences across the globe for this opportunity to uh, present this afternoon. And my focus is going to be on the isolation of MTB organisms from bioaerosols. This is um, not a new topic. Uh, here's um, a published study from uh, just over 100 years ago from Chausse, um, who was intrigued with uh, investigating the infectiousness of bioaerosols from his patients. And he developed um, this desktop uh, cough box in which there were guinea pigs. And he, um, he was able to show that about 38% uh, of his patients were able to infect guinea pigs. He also interestingly noted that the airflows within the box changed the results quite considerably. So um, uh, it was one of the first observations of that. Now here I've just put on uh, what I consider the, uh, the big changes in um, sensitivity of isolation of organisms over the last 100 years or so. And you can see that from the first decades of the uh, 20th century, they were still debating whether uh, TB was an airborne disease. And that was really um, nailed very well by Wells and Riley in the late 1950s, when they showed that you could take air from a TB ward um, get it to go through ducting to a colony of guinea pigs and then remotely infect the guinea pigs. So this showed that airborne um, uh, transmission of TB um, could go over distances um, and uh, uh, really stop the discussions on um, the origin of infections. Um, little happened over that hundred years uh, until about 2012, uh, Kevin Fennelly um, re-examined the cough box 
uh, of Chausset, but instead of using guinea pigs, he used uh, colony forming units on solid media in Anderson impactors. So his patients coughed into uh, this box and he found about 28% of his smear positive cases could transmit infections to guinea pigs. Things changed dramatically um, with the work of uh, Carolyn Williams um, and she was using a mask technology in order to capture um, uh, TB uh, DNA. And uh, this allowed the timing of um, uh, the collection to be much longer. Um, they were using hours as opposed to seconds or minutes. Uh, and they, um, they managed to get the sensitivity up to about 65%. Uh, in our group, P uh, Patterson, uh, ben, Benjamin managed to get up to 77% by combining DNA and colony forming units on an Anderson. And then um, the Williams group have uh, improved their sensitivity yet again. And probably because people are now willing to wear masks for longer, uh, they were wearing masks up to 24 hours and got up to uh, about 86% of their smear positive cases having airborne um, evidence of airborne mycobacterium. And then more recently, and that's what I'm going to show you here, we've increased the sensitivity further um, to about uh, 93%. So this is the technology that we use, and I could see some parallels with what Lydia was talking about. This is a personalized clean room. Um, it has um, um, HEPA filtration at a very high um, uh, rate of um, up to one cubic meter per second, and we collect uh, samples. And essentially on this cartoon, you can see uh, that the air flows are collected. Uh, we found that in order to uh, uh, capture explosive events such as coughs, that we needed to have very high flow rates. Uh, so we have a flow rate of about 300 liters per minute. Um, that flow is then directed to um, carbon dioxide monitor to give us an idea of volumes, particle sound, uh, size and quantification. Um, we collect the, um, the output in a liquid cyclone. So if we investigate the liquid collected with mass spectrometry, uh, we can get um, non-volatile organic compound analysis. And um, lastly, we can use the uh, particles within the uh, liquid cyclone to identify, quantify, and investigate the MTB organisms themselves. So just to show you um, briefly um, what sort of outputs we get. So on the left-hand side is a series of 10 coughs and you can see in blue, the carbon dioxide uh, concentrations uh, as we measured them. Um, and then in the lower panel, you can see the particle sizes again on a log scale, which is very important uh, from the green, which are relatively large particles to the black, which are um, in our case, uh, half to one um, micrometer. You can see that coincident with the um, carbon dioxide peaks, we can measure um, the size and numbers of particles. Um, that data was published um, a couple of years ago. Uh, on the um, right-hand panel, uh, which is something a little bit hotter off the press. It's just been reported in scientific reports. And this is the work of Darpeng Chen. Um, and he showed here a panel of uh, metabolites and lipids, which were increased in um, uh, patients, in uh, well patients that didn't have TB and in the lower panels in orange in patients with TB. And by combining the, these data together, you can get um, quite high uh, predictive values, rock curves of uh, with the areas under the curve of about 95%. Now I'm going to talk about what we actually, uh, what this topic of this talk is going to be, and that is the microscopic detection of TB. And this is based on this paper that was published um, uh, from the Stanford group uh, again uh, four years ago. And uh, what they uh, developed was a trailose sugar um, probe, which was taken up by um, organisms and processed by something called the antigen 85 complex and mycolated uh, trailos, which is then incorporated into the growing uh, TB um, or other organism membrane. Um, it seems as though antigen 85 is, has some specificity to the actinobacteria. Um, 
and um, that's a fairly broad grouping of organisms but um, I think it's uh, it, it's positive it's present in mycobacteria and also in non-TB uh, mycobacteria Carini bacteria um, uh, also in Nocardia which is relatively rare uh, the organism causes Whipple's disease which is uh, not really related to respiratory problems and uh, propionic bacteria which are basically skin so the um, the concern would be have we got any contamination from other mycobacteria and Carini bacteria. Uh, we take the, um, um, the sediment um, and we uh, spread it over uh, these nano wells uh, in order to give us um, optical fields um, uh, that are easily screened and also to increase our signal to noise ratio um, uh, so that we can identify small numbers of organisms. Um, we use fluorescent microscopy. And this is the sort of output that we get. So on the left-hand panel, you can see uh, the green fluorescence, which is concentrated in the uh, polar areas of the organism, uh, which are growing. On the right-hand side, top panel, you can see that we can explore for each individual uh, the fluorescence intensity along the length of the organism. And in most of the organisms, the, uh, the growth zones are at the poles, but you can see there's a few where the uh, um, the fluorescence is increased in the mid uh, mid sections, and we believe those are organisms that are uh, in the process of um, dividing. Uh, you can see that we have the ability to measure the length of these organisms, the width of these organisms, and the shape, and make correlations with um, uh, laboratory grown stains. If we look at the type of organisms uh, or the shape of the organism, the phenotypes of the organisms that we're identifying, you can see that they're pleomorphic. There's uh, a lot of different shapes and we're working on um, pattern recognition software in order to identify and to classify these, um, uh, these organisms. And um, the problem with any test that has very high specificity uh, we can uh, identify down to a single organism. Uh, you need to uh, address uh, specificity. So as I've mentioned, antigen 85 uh, limits uh, to the phylum actinobacteria. Uh, we have taken second specimens at each uh, sampling of our patients and stained and um, processed them for digital droplet um, RD9 PCR. Uh, the significance of that is that that distinguishes Mycobacterium tuberculosis from other mycobacteria. And we can also stain these parallel samples with oramine. And um, the two panels beneath show the relationship between DDPCR and oramine and our bacterial counts are significant. But an interesting, interesting observation, zeal nielsen stains were negative for this grouping. Uh, our microscopists are blinded to the sample source. We take a... Um, a uh, sample from the booths in exactly the same way as the patient sampling, and 100% of those samples uh, have, uh, uh, have revealed negative tests. And more excitingly, and this is um, very recent data, uh, this is work uh, done by Anast Anastasia Koch in our group. Uh, she's looking at how to deal with these very small biosample uh, mass and um, preliminary data shows that with multiple displacement DNA amplification, we can find uh, mycobacterial tuberculosis um, uh, DNA. And to date, we've not found any Carini bacteria DNA. Uh, the problem is that we can't get enough biomass at the moment uh, to get whole genome sequencing because the coverage uh, is not um, high enough. So can, how can we use this sensitive detection of airborne uh, organisms to give insights into important TB questions? So uh, the first one was, uh, which has sort of been touched on, is to look at cough versus other respiratory activities for TB production. And this is uh, a manuscript which uh, is in press. I think it's, um, it's online now with the American Journal. Um, uh, so it's, it's going to be in print in the next few days. And uh, just to briefly show this work from uh, uh, Ryan uh, Dinkele, who is a PhD student uh, in the IDM. And uh, what you see here is um, an APS uh, sampling um, particle counter. And you can see the boxes into which the particles are, um, uh, are attributed. And um, in the lower panel, you can see, again, on the log scale, uh, the particle uh, 
uh, size distribution um, um, for deep breathing, uh, the, the force vital capacity, which is meant to reproduce uh, Lydia's uh, bronchial burst uh, in the peripheral lungs, tidal breathing and coughing. And sure enough, coughing does produce more particles than uh, tidal breathing. But if we move on to look at the number of organisms, and we believe that these organisms are probably pr principally derived from the peripheral lung, you can see that uh, the counts are very similar across the three maneuvers, slightly higher in the tidal breathing group. And in the um, lower panel at the left, you see uh, the problem with dealing very small numbers that each of these uh, processes take place for about five minutes. Part of the reason for that is it's very unpleasant to cough for longer than five minutes. Uh, but if we take five minutes of uh, forced vital capacity, tidal breathing, or cough, we get about 70% positivity. But if you add them together combined, that's where we get the 93%. So the combined pooled is really a sample of 15 minutes, whereas the other ones are individual samples of uh, five minutes. So uh, Ryan goes on to discuss <clears throat> the probable um, contribution during a 24 hour period to infectiousness and uh, encourage you to, uh, to read that if, if you can get your hands on the paper. Uh, what I now want to do is to move to a topic which has uh, really driven my interest in this field. And this is a paper um, uh, written by uh, Sabine uh, Hermans uh, a few years ago. And we looked back at uh, the last 100 years of tuberculosis uh, in three cities, in London, New York, and in Cape Town. So on the left-hand uh, panel, you can see the population TB mortality, and there's good figures for all these um, uh, cities, and that's why I chose them. You can see that in the early 1900s, TB mortality was uh, very much higher in Cape Town than the others. Treatment came in in the 1950s, and you can see there was a, a massive decrease, which is really only came up again in the uh, late uh, um, 1990s um, uh, associated with the HIV epidemic. So if you dissect that out to see why did the mortality uh, po population mortality go down, you can see that uh, the case fatality was what drove it. And the case fatality and the use of treatment was equally effective in both three cities. But what you notice in the, in the um, um, right-hand panel is that uh, TB incidence rate or TB notification rate as a me measure of that didn't decrease and is still much higher than it was 100 years ago. And the latest survey in South Africa showed um, an incidence rate of about uh, 370, 732 uh, per 100,000. So you can see we have a major problem with transmission. Can we use this technology to try and address that? Um, uh, so this is um, a study which was just coming to completion looking at the prevalence of airborne organisms in uh, people attending a TB clinic. So here, um, if we're looking at what's driving the prevalence, if we go to the TB clinic population, the TB clinic uh, basically uh, separates individuals coming there into three mutually exclusive groups. The first one is TB disease, lab proven, sputum positive, gene expert positive. Second group is TB disease that's mere negative or sputum negative. And the third one is a group of people they don't think have got TB uh, who are uh, undiagnosed, untreated and uh, discharged from the clinic. This is looking at those three groups and you can see this is looking at symptoms that all three groups were symptomatic. The more symptoms were present in the sputum positive um, than the other two groups. But you can see that during the four visits, which spanned six months, that symptoms resolved uh, totally in, in each of the groups. Now, if we look at the prevalence of organisms in their aerosols, you see again, uh, surprisingly, that at baseline, it's around about 90% for all of them. And then otherwise, we were very surprised that the proportion of uh, individuals decreases at each visit and at the six month visit, still 20% of each of these three groups have organisms. However, very small numbers of organisms. So if you look at the numbers, you can see here the statistical decline in um, aerosol bacteria during the um, six months. But again, in group C, who are the individuals that were not diagnosed in TB, but were followed um, uh, for the same period, statistical decrease in numbers of organisms. 
So if we look again and um, somewhat arbitrarily divide this group into non-rapid decliners and rapid decliners, based on the, uh, the early data at, um, at two weeks, had they managed to virtually clear their organisms down to less than three organisms. You can see that um, uh, two, in multivariate analysis, two parameters uh, stand out. The first one is HIV, which is much more associated a sixfold higher uh, proportion in the non-rapid decliners. So it's a factor which um, is interfering with uh, treatment or time. And then the other one is previous history of TB, which is associated with an almost ninefold um, uh, um, increase amongst the rapid decliners. So there's obviously a major uh, immunological um, import to this, that uh, poor immunology or impaired Im immunology of HIV affects it one way, but somehow or other previous TB treatment affects it the other, the other way. So um, rounding this up, I find this um, uh, quite surprising. So it raises some questions of what is the nature of TB disease? Uh, we're showing that um, disease was proven in group A, was highly suspected in group B, but group C seemed to have a transient infection. So does this mean that TB organisms are necessary but not sufficient to cause TB disease? We have the question of why did group C present with symptoms? Was this a new strain of TB, a first infection with TB? Was there an intercurrent infection or some other immunological perturbation uh, between the balance between the host and the pathogen? Uh, it does raise the question of the role of inflammation. Uh, there's a lot of work now on uh, transcriptomic um, signatures for inflammation preceding a diagnosis of TB. Uh, there's PET-CT studies which have shown um, local inflammatory changes during treatment and after treatment in different parts of the lung. And the data that I showed you from DARPENG, um, many of those um, uh, chemicals and lipids uh, are host-derived rather than um, uh, pathogen-derived. So it raises that question. And then work for us to move forward is we obviously have to show that these uh, aerosol derived organisms can actually transmit infection. Um, then it raises the question of why aren't all areas of the lung uh, infected if, uh, if people are ex exhaling these at all times and re-inhaling them in their dead space. And then um, uh, the other <laughs> interesting field is now it's sort of moving microbiology into single cell microbiology or porcine bacterial microbiology. And I think that's uh, a very interesting uh, field uh, to develop. At the moment, um, um, uh, whole genome sequencing, et cetera, hasn't got down to, for our purposes, to single cell, but it may well be there in the near future. Uh, so on that, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, team in the Aerosol uh, Research Center and again, acknowledge my uh, collaborators and funders. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. And uh, I want to hear a lot more about various aspects of this. Um, and um, I look forward to uh, continuing the discussion. We have a question in the... Uh, Q&A here for Dr. Mawaska about the uh, saline uh, air administration to the airway and uh, what, what was, uh, uh, how, how did this uh, impact the aerosol generation, not just with breathing, but with uh, speaking and singing as well? Looks like you're muted. Lydia, you're muted. You want to go ahead and unmute yourself? I opened my, oh, sorry, I opened my camera, I didn't realize. We, in this study, we didn't go into this analysis exactly what's happening during different activities like singing um, and so on, but we definitely noticed that whichever activities um, and whatever people, whoever was speaking, it was affected by this airway hygiene. So by all means, there's much more studies needed. And in fact, we started, started more studies but clearly this is a very important factor. It seems like that uh, topic sort of converges with some of the things that Lydia Baruba was talking about and rheologic properties of, of the airways. 
uh, where is that saline, uh, the salt solution being deposited? Is it just in upper airways or is that getting out to the smaller airways where the bubble bursting in the air, airway closure reopening is happening? I don't think I have an answer to this question because we didn't model this. It is applied to the upper, to, to the nose. So okay. to, what, to what extent airflow will take some of them deeper? It probably will, but it is just qualitatively thinking about this. We have no quantification of this uh, effect. I don't know, uh, Lydia, did you do anything of this kind of analysis? Uh, not on injecting saline uh, into into subjects, but uh, by, but we did try to take samples initially from the bedside, and for at least mucus mucus secretions, and clearly with the addition of saline uh, was essentially really changing completely the rheology, making making it. Of course, it's known it's well known that that's a way to 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 get the, the mucus out, so it decreases the viscosity. But interestingly, it increases slightly the surface tension. And so there's slight competing differences on how then it changed the fragmentation. Uh, but I think that, but that was really a lot of saline in the respiratory tract, not just a not local. Just well, yeah. Yeah. And, and this gets to a point that Ad Bax has now been making for a while, that he thinks that a component of what masks are doing is independent of their uh, controlling uh, the dispersion from the source and has to do with hydrating the airway um, and uh, keeping us um, moist and uh, changing the rheologic properties essentially of the airway. What do you think? What do you guys think about that? Well, I think this goes a little bit outside my area of expertise. It's probably your area, Don, isn't it? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it, I, I think both of these are so, are interesting ideas. Um, uh, if you've changed the um, hydration, you may have changed a lot of features about how the innate immune response will be able to trigger uh, and respond, and also how well mucociliary clearance will work uh, and how rapidly. One of the things I've been impressed with is that uh, uh, we see uh, SARS-CoV-2 appear in saliva sometimes days before it appears in the nasal uh, specimens. Um, and uh, if it were landing in the nose first and mucociliary clearance was moving it down to the mouth, that's not what you would expect. But if it was landing in the intrathoracic airways and the mucociliary clearance was carrying it up to the mouth, that would make a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and that's very, very interesting, very, very difficult to to really capture. So I know of studies where they they looked at um, essentially removal of the tissue after on on animals, where to look at the role of humidity on the uh, penetration through the mucus layer, and indeed like having having high humidity is better for preventing uh, the uh, penetration deep to the target cells by the virus. Uh, on the other hand, then you, you also can create that aerosolization and, and therefore the trapping of that virus being in that, in that mucus. And so, so then the question becomes, uh, how are the properties of the mucus once they are removed in the droplet then interacting also to the with the survival? I think there's a lot of very um, entangled and very interesting questions that are still not unknown. Um, and that may be quite dependent on what virus you're, exactly. or bacteria that you're talking about. In, in the case of influenza virus, we know that the hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are polarized on opposite ends of the filamentous virus, which is probably why in humans infections, it's filamentous and not spherical. And this creates what's called a Brownian ratchet that allows it to penetrate through the mucus. So one might expect, in fact, that a more liquid mucus might actually facilitate the Brownian ratchet and rapid movement, whereas drying it out might help. Uh, it's right, that's it, right. it's, it's um, interesting to consider how, how does this really work? Mm -hmm. And in the case of coronavirus, it's spherical. How does it manage to get through the mucus layer? Uh, it's another interesting question. Um, 
I was going to also add the incredible variety, physiological variety between between people. Something which made me realize some years ago when we did something opposite inhalation studies, and our subjects were inhaling um, ultrafine particles from different combustion um, sources, and well, there was a big variation, but there was a curve. And then, after result, uh, the, analyzing the results, we saw that one person had hundred percent deposition so not that usual deep hundred percent and if not that the person was complaining that um, they felt a bit uncomfortable during the measurements we would have said well something happened during that me measurement but that made us think and then we approached the, the, that person and say well we are realized that you felt uncomfortable but we really would like to confirm that whether this was real or not and and they agreed it was real 100% deposition. And well, we didn't have funds to um, then to study deep um, acid, uh, characteristics of the physiology of that person, but otherwise all the prison parameters, she had, deep, uh, she had the same well, within the norm. So 100% deposition. Okay. And most of the deposition data has been modeled on spherical um, particles. Um, is there any view about MTB, which is a sausage-shaped uh, organism uh, that has a, an aerodynamic um, uh, particle size of about 0.2 microns when it's in air flows, but when it's in the peripheral lung where presumably flows are um, more, um, oh, there's very little in the way of flows, it, it, it's, it's more dis, uh, just dispersed. At that point, it would be uh, two microns in size. <laughs> Sorry about my doc. Do you think that um, is a, um, a mechanism that would enhance um, peripheral uh, de deposition of uh, uh, these organisms? Well, I don't know. Equi equivalent uh, when calculating any flow dynamic properties, equivalent diameter is recalculated. So uh, if it had different shape or um, so it uh, would be relatively easy to recalculate this aerodynamic diameter. Is it a matter that when, as it gets to lower flow rates, that settling, gravitational settling becomes a dominant factor and the fact that it's a, it's a big, long sausage causes it to fall out faster than if it were really a two uh, tenth of a micron particle? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which gets back around to another question um, this, the, uh, on the source side. Um, uh, it's been known now for probably 50 years that uh, maybe longer that uh, there's a, a phenomenon in which that's really entropy driven or, or hydrophobic interaction driven where mycobacteria, but also other organisms that are less hydrophobic than most mycobacteria, segregate into thin films. And there's a drainage of the liquid away from the film and, and the movement of the hydrophobic object, a virus or a bacteria into that film is the explanation for why we see high concentrations of these microorganisms in the air above seawater and in breath, in, and that it's uh, early on, I saw a number of papers coming out where people were modeling atomization and basically saying, well, it's a bulk fluid atomization. Well, it's not, it's clearly not. And that the dominant factor is this foam burst, film burst phenomenon driving the aerosols. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, even, even for, processes that are not even respiratory emissions, uh, at the end of the day, the atomization even of bulk fluids turn out to be going typically through a film breakup itself, because you never have really a, a you know, drop that then suddenly becomes two drops. You have always an aerodynamic, aerodynamic forces or shearing that essentially creates a film that ultimately punctures, creates itself ligaments, and then these ligaments become droplets for most, for most configurations. Sometimes it's directly uh, film to micro droplets. Sometimes it's film ligament micro droplets, but it's never bulk droplets <laughs> transition. There's always a film ultimately involved. 
So absolutely. Uh, and, and the modeling of bulk, or just the bulk part is, is really, even for physical processes and industrial applications is, is the wrong model for atomization. So uh, Lydia Garuba, you've done this elegant modeling of these boluses of, and how this turbulent bolus is affecting both evaporation and transport in the environment. To what extent um, during speaking or even singing, are these phenomenon dominant as opposed to convection in the room? Um, I understand in cough and especially in sneeze, these are really strong driving factors. But in our studies where we observe somebody for half an hour while they're giving samples, we almost never see influenza cases sneeze. We very rarely have seen uh, COVID cases sneeze. They do, COVID cases cough a little bit, but nothing like flu cases. Um, and, and it really seems in COVID to be talking and singing that are driving it. So what I'm, I'm really interested to know, what is the role of this gas bolus under that, those conditions? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So that the, the figure I showed at the end is really, so the, you wanna study these things in the extreme conditions. So that's what we started with that, with the coughs and, and sneeze to, that's why we discovered the presence of even this cloud. But in fact, when we went back to look at, you know, even just breeding, you have high enough Reynolds numbers, so essentially momentum, that the gas phase uh, is still trapped, is still there. The model is the same, essentially mathematically. You don't have to revert back to uh, considering isolated droplets, uh, but it's just that the total energy of that is in that gas phase is reduced, which means that you still, to model the dispersal, have to account for that gas phase that is trapping these micro droplets from talking or breathing or, or singing. Uh, it's just that the, the original momentum would be lower than if you're doing coughing or sneezing. So, so but what is the distance that we would expect in uh, an indoor environment uh, with a, a very low relatively low, but still moving air. Yeah. How, so, what, what is the distance we expect that, bolt, that that cloud to travel? So it would travel in still a consistent way. So essentially coherent still bolus, as you, as you call it. I like that. <laughs> uh, essentially, we're talking about three to four meters if you're talking about singing, depending. Uh, if it's very you know, extreme singing, so you know, opera type singing generate essentially momentum that is similar to a cough so that you're still talking about about that distance of coherence uh, so up to let's say four or even potentially five if, for, for very high uh, you know opera type singing for talking breeding you're still within that two to three meter zone uh, but what is the really the difference is that it's it's not just that the aerosols are just sticking there you have these pockets of turbulent flow that might not be the full emission but that can be detached and essentially still carry them in concentrated packet. And I think that that's really where on over those shorter distances where the cloud still remain important to, to incorporate because if you were to just say, this is the total amount emitted and divided by uh, the space around the person, ignoring these co local concentration pockets, it would be a lower exposure uh, but including the concentration pockets, you can find these high uh, exposure regions that are intermittent, but uh, essentially potentially much more effective. But when we go outdoors, we still see these plumes. Yes. That's right. And um, we had uh, the chair of our virology department here contracted the infection very early in the pandemic and, and reported on his department website that he was convinced that he got it standing in line outside of a grocery store with a gentle breeze blowing down the line towards him. And he remembered, he said, standing there thinking, well, I hope nobody up front has it because I'm gonna get it. And That's right. <laughs> two days later, the fever began. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and another virology professor here picked it up sitting next to somebody at a picnic table at an outdoor brunch. That's so, right. Outdoors is not an absolute, it doesn't instantly dilute because there's a large volume there to, to dilute the aerosol. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the other question, if we can take a, another run over by a minute or two. Yep, go for it. Um, 
is this really fascinating question about the TB negative, the suspected cases. Are they colonized? Are they truly infected? Do they develop a delayed type hypersensitivity response? And what does this mean for transmission? Those are all questions which um, um, the work raises. So what, what was it in that uh, group C? They certainly had viable organisms uh, or meta metabolically active organisms. We haven't shown that they're infectious, but it's, um, it would seem intuitively that that would be uh, reasonable. Um, I, I think you mentioned the word colonized and um, uh, the reason that um, I think that might be the way forward is that latent infection is, it's a funny mixture that, that uh, in order to have positive quantiferon or TSD tests, you do need continual exposure to antigens and colonization would do that. Um, in our part of the world, um, the majority of adults, 70% uh, of them have immunological evidence of previous exposure and one of the other questions that came to mind was at the end of six months treatment, would you prefer to be somebody who had totally cleared the infection or someone who is now in immunological colonized balance with the infection? So I think it, it raises those sort of questions. So we need to follow those people um, uh, prospectively. And then it also raises the um, question of what, what are vaccines trying to achieve? If you got people who are living in uh, some form of um, immunological balance, um, is that going to be, um, what, what is your target um, mm -hmm. of the vaccine? Is it to, uh, to clear that? Is it to um, stop uh, this sort of inflammatory progression to disease? So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, as with most scientific uh, things, it's, it's produced more ignorance and questions and it has uh, solutions. A very, really fascinating topic. And then, you know, enters into another whole topic about what are we trying to do with vaccines? Yep. Uh, measles uh, vaccine, I think, gave us a standard for uh, what a vaccine can do that is almost in fat and smallpox have given us a, you know, set the goalposts really far out uh, and very high and it's very hard to, to reach them with anything else. And, and one has to wonder when one, I used to study the hygiene hypothesis of asthma and allergy pathogenesis. And one has to wonder if we did eliminate all these infections, how bad would the allergy and asthma problem be? Um, and so there, there is a, a comp, life is a dynamic balance. It's a homeostasis and we have to, be, try to understand where that balance is. So thank you for a wonderful discussion today and great presentations. Um, I wanna turn it back over to the conference organizers. Excellent. Um, I just want to um, echo one more time. Um, thank you so much, Don, for leading a great session today. And of course, to Lydia, Lydia and Robin, for some fantastic talks. I think the, the presentations and the discussion were really informative. Um, thank you very much to our audience for joining us today. As always, please take a moment to complete the survey that's linked in the chat box and give your feedback um, and give um, suggestions for future life science across the globe events. And don't forget to join us again on July 6th um, for life science across the globe hosted by the University of Buenos Aires in Conocet in Argentina. Um, and that one will be focused on gender policies in science.